Divine Truth Assistance Group Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love group and is part of the Education in Love series. In the My Will to Love Q&A presentation, Jesus answers questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation, My Will to Love. Recorded on the 12th of March, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Okay. None of the music that we are doing in, this, uh, in these sessions will be actually on the recordings, because obviously there's copyright issues and so forth. So, uh, so you, have to, you won't be able to remember them. And I, I don't know if we will actually even put them on the list. I said, said to the guys last week I would, but I don't know if we will. Okay, my will to love Q&A, your last opportunity. Last opportunity, you have just questions and answers. Paul, thank you. Um, when I try to focus on my sin and just um, ask God and just become aware, you know, especially my projections onto women and stuff like that and, <laughs> and other stuff which yep. I'm unaware of. Yeah. But I just feel so awful, and it's really hard to stay with, and I often think, well, I think I need something to eat now, or... <laughs> 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 and, um, yeah. So when God tries to share with you God's feelings about what you've done, you feel awful, mm. and then you use other techniques to avoid the feelings. That's that's what I want to do, and that's what I mostly do. Yep. Often do I, I, you know, it's hard to stay with it for very long. It seems. So, what's the question? Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, um, but but just staying with that in that space um, of, you, of feeling awful. Can you see the reason why you don't want to stay in the space? Because it feel because because I feel awful. No, it's because you don't want to feel awful. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you see? Like, yeah, yeah, I do. For so, sure. so what I would do is I'd say, look, I don't want to feel awful. Mm. Like, remember right uh, way back in the first two days, we, we, we have to see what we want. We have to be honest about what we want. And most of us don't want to feel awful. That is the truth. We don't. Mm. And it's a choice to not feel awful that turns off what God's trying to tell us most of the time. Mm -hmm. like, so we're making a decision in that moment to not feel awful because we, we, don't, we, we, you know, we don't feel we can cope with the feeling. Mm -hmm. so, so obviously you don't want to feel the feeling. right? So, so this is where you need to allow yourself to go, okay, firstly I need to develop an aspiration to feel the feeling before I'm going to feel the feeling. So it's one thing to ask God for the truth, quite another to receive it and then have to feel the feelings about it and then say to God, well, I don't want to. If that's what the truth is, I don't want to feel it. <laughs> you know, we're basically, it's sort of like, it's like the aspiration or the desire to, the prayer to God is not really fully sincere yet, is it? Can you see? Yeah. Because it, really what we're doing is we're saying, God, please tell me what I need to know. And then we start feeling awful. And God's already starting to tell us what we need to know there. And so what do we do then? We go, no, I don't, want to, I don't want to feel awful. I just want you to tell me what I need to know without making me feel awful. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? That's really what we're saying. So, so we're trying now to bargain with God's truth. That's what we're trying to do in those states. And we need to be honest about the fact that we want to do that. I, I want to not feel awful. So, so, like, I have said to you guys that while pain, the prevention of pain, is your primary decision point, no real progress is going to happen. And, that, and this is an example, Paul, the prevention of pain is what you're trying to do. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so while that is your primary point of decision, as while that's the cho choice of the, or the exercise of your will to make that choice is happening, then it's highly unlikely God can share further information with you and therefore your progress will be very slow. Right? 
the key is to be able to feel and to have the confidence, isn't it, to feel all emotions that God wishes to share with you, right? And the emotions that God's wishing to share with us a lot uh, will be quite confronting to us because God's opinion of what we've done is pretty, it's pretty intense, what we've done. That's the reality. What we've done is pretty intense in terms of damage to ourselves, damage to others. And, and at some point we're going to have to feel it. What, the way I see it is if I feel it and I realise, wow, that's really bad, you know, and I go through the process of feeling how bad that was, then can you see at the end of the day, I probably will never do it again. So an essential part to me making the decision to never do something sinful again is actually to feel the results of the sin. If I'm not prepared to feel the results of the sin, if I'm not prepared to feel God's feelings about what that sin is, is like, then, then I, I, I'm just not going to ever change because it's highly likely I, I will do that same sin again, put in the same circumstances. So, so yeah, Paul, that's, uh, that's the issue there. The issue, as I've spoken to you many times, is about allowing yourself to feel emotion and allowing yourself to feel emotion and sitting with feelings that even feel really bad, being able to feel them and allow yourself to be sensitive to them. Yeah, yeah thank that's, you. That's the thing that needs to change there. And, that, and, and to develop an aspiration to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah. To firstly grow the aspiration to do that. At this point in time, the aspiration is not very strong. So you want to hear from God, you want to feel God's love, but you're in a bargaining issue, you're in a bargaining process with him about the truth. Right? And that needs to be given up. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. If we come to Christiana and then to Diane over. Uh, this week I had some um, lovely law of attractions to put into practice what we're learning. Um, I came up uh, with an issue where I thought, okay, now's a really good time to put uh, a brushstroke on it of if this was happening to me, how would I want to um, be treated or whatever. But then I started questioning if my brushstroke... Uh, is full of addiction and in error opposition to what God would do, um, how does that um, brushstroke work? Well, see, this is where experimentation, the willingness to experiment. See, if you're not so addicted to pain, pain prevention of pain, mm -hmm. the, the, the problem with the addiction of prevention of pain is this. So if pain is my goal, the avoidance of pain, so I'm the, I want to avoid the pain, and that's my only goal, you can see that if I suspect that one course of action will cause more pain, then I'll, then I'll definitely choose to not do that course of action. But if I doubt that another might, I will probably avoid that action too. And so what do I end up doing? Not doing anything. Correct. Which is a sin from God's perspective, right? So, 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 so it, I would be better off, wouldn't I, being prepared to feel pain, taking the action that I think is the right action, not avoiding that action, but taking the action that I think is the right action, and then measure the results. Does that make sense? That would be my better choice, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. But we don't do that because we are addicted to avoiding potential pain. Yeah. So, so, so really this gets down to developing a desire to experiment even if the outcome might be some more pain. Yeah. You see? Yeah. Now, if the desire to experiment is based upon your desire, your aspiration to grow in love, then, then you won't be addicted to just avoiding pain anymore. Yeah. So, so even if you chose to do something that was out of harmony with love, you didn't realise it was out of harmony with love, but through the process you learnt that it was, Right, that is better than choosing to not do anything. Yeah. Mm. Does that answer the question? It's the ir uh, irony of it is that um, I ended up what I was believing to be a uh, one thing, um, 
what I was really going on was that it wasn't anything about that I wanted to be loving or lo not loving, is the fact that I was just so terrified of losing my security and it was had a totally different, completely issue to what was going on. Yeah. So this is what normally happens is that you get, you know, if you do take an action, you do get exposed pretty quickly what the underlying motivation <laughs> for the action was. And that's the beauty of making decisions rather than avoiding making decisions. Yeah. Is that if you make decisions, you'll end up learning something that you didn't know before. Yeah. Right? And that's a very important part of your progress. The key is to measure the results and then make the learn, learning <laughs> connection. You see, you make the relationship between cause and effect. This is also what we many, avoid, many of us avoid too, though. So, so unfortunately, we choose to take an action. We don't measure its results. And then we make a whole heap of presumptions. Right. So it, it would be better to, you're actually better off acting, even if acting it was, you, you thought it was in harmony with love, but it turns out it was out of harmony with love. Right. It, you're better off doing that and learning in the process than you are not acting at all. Yeah. Yeah. The other lesson that I got was that as soon as I stopped self-punishing, then God was able to talk to me and tell me the real reason. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Self-punishment, honestly, it's a very, it's a, it's a very, it's a learned um, thing that we do from our childhood, in order to avoid truth, yeah. not not to get it, <laughs> right? So we need to see it as such. Yeah. We need to see it as a slippery eel, <laughs> <laughs> slipping out of what's really going on. That's what self-punishment's all about. And in fact, self-punishment is very narcissistic. Right, because we do something that's unloving to another person generally, and then when they point it out, we punish ourselves further. But but what have we done to help that person? We just harm nothing. In fact, quite often we're wanting something from them. We want them to, what we want them is to, you know, to say, oh, it's all right. You know, it's not that as bad as what you're feeling. In fact, we really just want another addiction met by that person. You know, so yeah, self self punishment is. Uh, is a very manipulative tool that we've learnt to use. This is how we learnt to manipulate our parents. Mm -hmm. um, it's a manipulative tool in order to avoid the full consequences of our actions and to redress the unloving behaviour with the person involved. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, very negative process, self-punishment. Yeah. Diane, thanks. Um, you've kind of half answered in that but I guess my question is um, you've said that we have a lot of good spirits around us who are wanting to help us mm -hmm. how do I know when it's a, there are good spirits wanting to help me and when there's when there's just when they're not like when they're not helping but you've, you've sort of half answered it with the self-punishment thing because I I think what I was doing was I was feeling bad and feeling like that was repentance when it was just... No, a lot, a lot of very negative spirits want you to feel bad about yourself. Yes. So how do, how, do the, how do the good spirits help us? Like, can you give a picture of in what way? How will we know? That um, here's an experiment. I'll give you an experiment instead. How's that? In the next week, be open to reading the thoughts that appear in your mind about actions that you're taking just uh, over a week over a period of a week just be open to hearing the thoughts in your mind there'll be two types of thoughts there'll be thoughts that pull down your desire to love and there'll be thoughts that improve your desire to love there'll be those two types of thoughts so so what i'm doing here is it's an experiment to analyse my own thoughts, right? And there'll be two types of thoughts dropped into my mind. One type of thoughts will be trying to improve my desire to love. In other words, they're, they're trying to uh, inspire me to love. Um, inspire to love. And another kind of thought that will drop into your mind will be inspire to sin.
Okay? Now, they are the two types of thoughts that you have. Now, the next thing you do is you work out whether those thoughts came from your own feelings or aspirations or whether they came from an external source. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you now have to be sensitive to which, which source did these came from. There can be the source of myself. In other words, they came from within me. Or they came from external influences. Right? Mm -hmm. to, to me. Now, can you see that if I get a thought that's inspiring me to love but it didn't come from me, where, where obviously must it come from? Yeah, somebody good. Somebody who's <laughs> nice, right? Yep. Somebody who's more loving than I am. Because yep. a lot of the thoughts that drop in our mind, we wouldn't even consider doing them without the thought dropping into our mind. And if you're honest with yourself, you go, yeah, I, I didn't have any idea about that, right? But somebody told me and it did inspire me to love, so therefore it has to come from a source that's in harmony with love, yeah. right? It can't come from the devil, or as the saying goes, because if it's, out of, if it's in harmony with love, it's pretty pointless. Somebody who's bad telling you something is in harmony with love, right? If it inspired me to sin, if it helped me sin, and, and it wasn't a thought that originally came from my own mind, then where did it have to come from? It has to come yeah. from a spirit who's trying to inspire me to sin. Mm. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so all I need to do is ask myself two basic questions. What are my thoughts? Mm -hmm. Write down all your thoughts in the day that you realise. You can even do it moment by moment if you just have like a book on the kitchen you know, table or something, and you go, oh, I had another thought there, you just go and write that down. Oh, I had another thought there, just write that down. You know, thoughts that just pop into your mind and ask yourself now what the source is. Do you feel the source is you or do you feel the source is external to you? Mm -hmm. And develop your sensitivity and awareness to which source and what the inspiration is to. Now, now if the inspiration is to love... It really doesn't matter what the source is, does it? No. It just makes sense to do it, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and I, I guess sometimes I get so caught up in what is love that I get, I just confuse myself and then it just. So you just have another column in your book that says, I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> and you write down all the confusions. Yep. You, so there are things that you know for certain are loving, and there's things you know for certain are not. And then there's things you don't know for certain anything about at all. Mm. So make three columns and put, put the stuff you don't know in the third column. Mm. And then again, take experiments to try and resolve those third column issues. Mm -hmm. Because there are probably areas where you're accidentally sinning or you, you, know, you don't mm. realise you're sinning and you need to address. Yep. Do you follow? Yep. But this is something we can do with a bit of aspiration. It doesn't take much effort just in a course of a day, we do that for a week or do that for a month and you'll have a very clear picture of what kinds of spirits are trying to inspire you to sin and what their motivation is and when they motivate you. So whenever the, mm. you're motivated into self-punishment, mm. did that come from you? In other words, is it a learned behaviour from your childhood? Or if it's not a learned behaviour from your childhood, it's got to be inspired by somebody else. Mm. So there's spirits trying to cause you to go into self-punishment rather than resolve the issue. Do you see? Yeah. yeah. Um, that's how you determine what's going on. And, mm. and anything that's inspiring you to sin, you go, okay, this is my sin list. This is my inspiration to sin list. These are things that I obviously need to work on, mm -hmm. develop an aspiration to resolve emotionally within myself. If I'm open to hearing, you know, to go and murder somebody, then obviously I have a feeling inside of me that needs to be addressed, whether it be one of guilt or shame or shame about past behaviour or the shame about past feelings like that. Or it could be all sorts of things that cause that openness. Or it could be just a simple thing like, I'm so open to the suggestions of men that um, a man can drop a thought into my mind any time and I'll take it on board. Mm. It could be just that simple. Mm. Right? So the key is to work through these issues from an from a experimentation perspective. Yeah. You can experiment with these things, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, you don't have to be afraid of that process. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, instead, most of you, I, what I see when we talk about spirits, many of you go, oh, I'm just freaked out about who's around me. I just really don't want to know. I know, and I think that, <laughs> I, well, I think that stops me from even hear, from hearing from my guide. Cause of I'm course going, it does. Who, like, I, yeah. I don't know who's who. And, yeah. The people who love you will not suggest unloving things to you. Yeah. The people who don't love you will always suggest unloving things to you. This is why many of you have still yet to realise that your families don't love you. Because frequently they suggest unloving things to you. Mm. And frequently you think, oh, well, they love me, so, you know. But it's not true. They're suggesting an unloving thing to you, therefore they don't love you. Do you, do you understand? Yeah. It's very simple, really. Yeah. All we need to do is find the source. The type of information tells us the source particularly when it's consistent, right? So we analyse that over a period of time. The type of information tells us the source. So, so if every time you feel like you've been influenced, you know, with words uh, popping into your mind that cause you to get really down and depressed about yourself all the time, where do you think that's coming from? Mm. It was highly likely it was coming from spirits who just want you to be down and depressed all the time. Mm. Why would they want that? Because they know in that place you'll probably sin more. Mm. Yeah. That's why they want Thank it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if we go to right up the back, thanks. And to Philip over here on this side. Thanks. <coughs> Keep your hand up. Yep. Hi, I realized, <coughs> excuse me, that. Um, when I'm alone, I really don't feel a lot of emotion, but when I'm out in public, it seems like I get triggered more. Yep. And I was just realizing, is that because I create addictions when I'm alone to kind of comfort me, and then when I go out in public, they kind of have to drop in order to navigate the world? Yeah, there's a couple of things happening. Um, firstly, firstly, when you're out in public, you like people noticing your emotions as well. So there is an addiction to have other people interact with your emotional state. When you're home by yourself, you, you actually are in a better position to feel emotion, but, but you won't get any addictions met if you feel one. Right? And so this, like, this is a big issue for yourself, I feel. Just when people are around, you're more prepared to feel emotion. When people are not around, you're less prepared to feel emotion. And uh, a lot of that has to do with the fact that you want people to share in your emotion with you. Now, this is a big, this is a big uh, issue, usually from childhood, for many, for many people, actually, that in the end, they really want somebody to commiserate with their emotion before they'll let themselves feel their own emotion. It also means, though, that, that, it's hot, that you've obviously been taught to only experience emotion when you've got a feeling of the safety and security of other people knowing what their emotion is. In other words, needing validation for your emotion. Does that make sense? Mm. So if you have a look at those two feelings, you'll probably find that's what's going on. The reality is the kindest thing to do is to just feel your emotion all the time, whether you're in public or not. But obviously the most kind thing to do is when you are or begin feeling an emotion, that you actually do it in privacy so that other people are not bothered by your emotion. Yeah. Yep. So if you can't feel in private, it's because of addictions. Yep. Again, when it comes to using your will, it's there, okay, my will is to meet my addictions. So, so I've got to, again, examine my desire to meet my addictions rather, and, and do I want to have an aspiration to no longer do that or not? What, what, what's my choice going to be? Yep. Okay, Philip? Yep, the first one is a clarification, um, something that you said, the Holy Spirit was attracted to the truth. Yes. Is the Holy Spirit God? No. The Holy, the Holy Spirit is God's... You could think of it like a pipe. A pipe. So, so there's God. Let's draw a little diagram for you. I've, done, I've drawn this diagram many times before, Philip, but it doesn't hurt to go over it. There's God, there's you. Well, let's do it as your soul, because it's only your soul that actually receives love, right? 
So for love to flow from God who exists outside of the universe to you, there has to be a, an, an energy pipe connected. And this energy pipe I called in the first century the Holy Spirit. And what it is is like a conduit through which love flows. But the connection happens because of truth, not because of love. So when you and God are in harmony with truth and you exercise a desire for God's love, now the energy can flow through the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the conduit for the energy of love to flow through. Do you follow? I got it. Thank yep. you. The second part is that with the communication directly with God, yep. um, the best state for me... It'll be feelings, to, firstly, Philip. Feelings, I've got that. Yep. But is it like during my meditation time when I'm, I'm quiet and open and, and peaceful to receive? No, I feel you can communicate, well, you can receive information from God 100% of the time, no matter what you're doing. It depends on your longing for it. So the heartfelt longing, which is what I call prayer, is the openness in your soul to receive information from God. And in particular, receive love from God. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what, if your heart's open, your heart can be open while you're talking to other people, while you're doing things. Surfing or... Yeah, like surfing, it. whatever. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to be, you know, sitting down meditating. And in fact, the meditative process, as it's defined by most New Age philosophy, is actually an avoidance of emotion. So, so it's actually the opposite way you have to go if you're going to really be real with God. So in tune, trying to be in, in tune and open. Yeah, open, uh, have a longing for God to be able to show you things and tell you things and so forth, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep, the longing begins in your heart. Yep. Dave, just straight down in front with the mic. Sorry. Just following on from Jen's question earlier. Um, you mean in the previous yep. session? Yep, yep. Fire? So if I'm asking a question of somebody just about things I don't know versus if I'm asking a question about myself, um, am I then giving away my will and could I be doing something else like some sort of an experiment? Well, let, let's personalise it for yourself more than that, shall we, Dave? You know you have a habit of giving away your will. You know that. You know you do it with spirits. And what, what is your underlying motivation for doing it? Do you know your motivation? Sometimes it's to feel special, to feel better than I feel in myself. Correct. So the desire to feel special. Yep. And, and these spirits feed you with information which you then think you know more than other people around you, so therefore you feel special. Yep. Any other, mo any other reason for the motivation? Uh, so I, I don't have to take responsibility for things? Yes. In other words, you don't want to take responsibility for your life, so you put your life in the hands of other people and you just do what they suggest to you. And you remember you went through a process in your life where you basically just got up every morning and said, what do you want me to do today? Basically, yeah, yeah. that's what you did every day, right? Yeah. So that, that's an indication of how desperate you are to give your will away. right? So, so if you're that desperate to give your will away, can you see that many of your questions are all about wanting another person to give you the answer so that you don't have to take responsibility for your own choice? Yep. Do you understand? Yep. So, 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 for example, if I, if I want to know something, I know that all I have to do is do a series of experiments and I'll find out. When you want to know something, you ask somebody else. <laughs> Yeah, right. Okay. You're not willing to engage the experiment because you don't want to go through the process of getting the outcome. You, you want the other person to be responsible for, the, for getting the outcome for you and giving it to you. Yep. You follow? So yep. this is a big addiction for you. So, so, so can you see almost every question you ask as a result of that is going to be m manipulated by the underlying tendency of wanting the other person to make the choice for you. Yeah. Rather than you making a decision for yourself. Yeah. Does that make yeah. sense? So, so when you have a desire to ask a question, I, I, with myself, I would just sit with that and go, okay, am I just putting my 
the answer to this question in the hand, like, can I, is this something I could experiment with and find out for myself, or is this something that I'm just wanting someone else to be responsible for? And, I, and if I worked out, well, hang, hang on a sec, I, I have a feeling this is about what I want somebody else to be responsible for, then I wouldn't put up my hand. I'd, and I'd instead write down, experiment with blah, 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 whatever, whatever the issue was, you know, to find the answer myself, you know. This is where I feel uh, for yourself and for many spirit-influenced people, and there's quite a number of spirit-influenced people in the audience, um, you, you need to make a choice to stop giving your will away and start making a choice to be responsible for your own decisions and your own actions and your own investigation, investigative process. To find out for myself. Find out for yourself, yeah, and go through the process of finding out for yourself. Now, I'm not suggesting don't ask questions, but, but I'm suggesting to you, in particular for you, that your main motivation for asking questions is so that somebody else tells you what to do and then you don't have to take responsibility for the outcome when you've done what they wanted. Yeah. That's the main motivation you have for asking a question at this stage. Yeah, and so I put my, myself in the hands of others and they may have loving or un, unloving intents. And you don't even care either way because you've put yourself in the hands of spirits who don't care for you at all, willing to kill you even, um, you know, because you don't really care either way. And this tells me you have a desperate need and a desperate addiction from your childhood of never making your own decision because you were too afraid to make your own decision. So that's what I'd investigate yeah. emotionally. Well, why are you so afraid to use your own will? There's got to be something in your childhood that caused you to be this afraid about using your own will. Does that make sense? Yes, thank yep. you. Good. And if we go to Ivana, just here. <coughs> Um, I might possibly be doing what Dave does, but I was just going to ask you about yesterday when um, you mentioned that my anger was the resistance to feeling my fear. Mm -hmm. Do I still need to actually feel my demand towards men to look after me financially? Well, um, the main... It's a personal question, but let's look at the general principle, okay. shall we, Ivana? Um, and I'm trying to get you guys away from personal questions into general principles because a general principle can be applied to almost any question you ask on, you know, of a similar nature. Whereas if I talk to you about specifically anger or whatever, then you're not going to apply it to a lot of other areas of your life. The reality is anger results from demands not being met. Yep. So, so obviously addictions play a large role in that and when an addiction is not met you get angry now the the desire to get angry is not just the addiction not being met though it's also another choice that's being made so and this is frequently what we do we make the choice justifying that the addiction should be met yeah and i, I you um, see that yeah since i've been experimenting like since you had that conversation with justin i have been experimenting with my feelings towards men in particular and how I feel like they should <laughs> look after me. That's the feeling you need to feel, that they should. Yeah. Where does this feeling come from? Well, somebody in your childhood created it. Now, most women have had this created by their mothers because most mothers have a feeling towards men that man's got to provide me with the physical security, emotional security and particularly financial security um, and that that's his role, you know, that's his job. And, and a lot of men support that as a choice as well. So it comes from both the man and the woman to the child. Yeah. So the child grows up in this environment where that's what men do. If a man loves you, that's what he does, right? And, and there's the demand. The demand remains. And, but it's the justification and the minimization of the anger that causes you to revert to anger. So, so, so we can have any demand at all. So let's say we have a demand of any kind, and in your case it's a demand for men to make, say, look after emo, uh, e economic security, let's say. So that's the demand, but it could be anything. It could be, you know, I, I just want somebody to make my fear go away, or I want somebody to love me, or I, want, I feel that somebody should do a job for me that they sh you know, should have done, and so forth. It's just a, any demand at all. When the demand is not satisfied and I get angry, we need to see that this is a choice that we've just made to get angry. Right? Most people don't see it as a choice. They think it is a justified right 
Yeah. Right? Yeah. To get angry. It's, it's actually a choice. What does anger do? Let's look at the results of anger. When a person gets angry, the people around them will probably what? Do what you want. Okay, so it's a manipulative technique. So we've learnt from our childhood that anger is a manipulation. You could actually say that it's blackmail, could you not, upon our environment. We're basically blackmailing our environment. We're basically saying, if you don't do what I want, I am going to get angry with you. And once you're at, you don't want to be, you don't want to feel my anger. I'm going to make sure that you feel it and you, don't, you, you, you want to stay away from that. So you're better off doing what I want. That's really what we're saying. And I do that a lot. Yep. Yeah. It's a manipulation or a blackmail. It's a manipulative technique to get the demand met. So, so usually what happens is we have a demand. The demand's not met. So in other words, we go, most people in their life are like this. They go around basically with all these demands coming out of them emotionally. Which the average person, if you become sensitive, can, can really feel. You can feel, oh, this person just wants me to listen to them. They don't care what I say. As long as I just listen to them, that's all they want, for example. And so as long as you sit there and listen to them, that person's going to think you're a nice person. But as soon as you try to say something to them, they get angry. It's like my mum. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I brought it up. But, but so, so there we are. We've got this demand coming out of me, right? And, and like, so for example, for your mother, demand is just listen to me. Don't tell me anything. Just listen. I can't even get a word in. Like, no. Yeah. No, impossible, yeah. right? So, so she, she now, and then as soon as that demand's not met, so as soon as you don't listen, what does she get? Angry. Angry. Yep. Or if I try to say something, she'll be like, just let me finish my story. Exactly. exactly. She shuts <laughs> up, right? So, she, so she's manipulating you, blackmailing you back into submission of what her demand is. That's the point. Yep. And you've learned that from a master. <laughs> Your mother. Oh, so <laughs> Your mother's the master, right? <laughs> and you've learned that. So of course you're going to probably do the same things, right? as what she has done to, to manipulate events going on around us. Now, we need to see that the initial anger itself is the desire to manipulate and control and blackmail people back into submission. It's a power trip. Okay. So, uh, Does right. that make sense? The anger is a power trip over the other person, trying to get them back into the place of submission, back to meeting my demands. Yep. Right. And we need to see that is a different choice than just feeling the anger itself. Can you see? Uh, one is using the anger as a tool to manipulate you. Oh, sure. The other one is to go off and feel my anger and bash the thing about how, uh, how I feel my demand wasn't met, which is more related to the demand not being met. The other is a tool that I'm using to manipulate you, which is a choice I'm making to manipulate you. Okay, so when I get angry towards Justin, I'm yep. trying to manipulate him. Yeah. Whereas if I just am at home and recognise the feeling of anger within myself and just feel that. Then it's then different, it's isn't it? Because now you're now feeling more related to the actual original issue now. Yeah. Okay. The fact that a, a certain addiction is not being met, you can feel it's not being met and you're starting to connect with that. Yep. That's very different than using anger as a tool to manipulate somebody else. Okay. Yep. Isn't it? So the choice to use anger as a tool to manipulate somebody else or any other emotion. So a lot of times we use anger. There are a number of go-to places we have when it comes to these emotions. Anger is a great manipulative tool because most people are scared of it. Another manipulative tool is shame. So if I can shame you, make you feel guilty or guilt is another manipulative tool. If I can do that to you. If I can make you feel afraid... Or claim that I'm afraid, <laughs> right? Then often that manipulates men in particular. You know, men and men just want to bend over backwards as, as soon as. Oh, me claiming that I'm afraid. Yeah, if you claim you're afraid. When I'm not really. When you're not really, right? Do I do that? If you claim you're afraid, well, because men bend over backwards for a woman who's afraid. They generally do. Okay. Most men do. They'll, they'll just go, this is my role. This is a man's role. Make the woman feel safe again. 
and and most men have been taught to have that so so most women have used to learn to learnt to use their fear as a manipulative tool of men do you see so so now all of these choices they're all using my will to not love but to sin yep. all right so so they're all going to create further harm but really what they're doing is they're attempting to manipulate blackmail bribe so i can just get my way so you can get your way I'd I just have another question that popped up. Just yep. when you're saying that um, women use fear to manipulate men, I guess that addiction in itself would be a reason for me not to let go of my fear. Like if I of course. Would, yeah. yeah, because if you let go of your fear, who's going to look after you? You have to look after you. You're not going to be projecting at men. They have to do it. Yeah, okay. I so there's a justification to not release fear in most women, right? Yeah. And, and let's face it, most men are either wanting a woman's fear to go away or they're terrified of women. <laughs> they fall into one of those two categories generally. So this is where women often switch between those two roles, where they make the man feel afraid and then when that doesn't work, they then claim their own fear. Okay. You, you see? And it's just all manipulative techniques yep. to get our demand met again. Right. Mm -hmm. Now the demand is the original sin. Yep. In this example, not yep. the original sin, <laughs> humanity, <laughs> but the original sin that's, that's triggered these serious events. But the choice to manipulate is another sin. Yep, okay. So that's just like you were explaining in the previous um, session, just adding to the sin. Yes. Yep. Yep. So, so the demand is the original sin. There must be a reason for that original sin being conducted, which obviously is a hole inside of oneself to do with an addiction of some kind. But when it's not met, the choice to manipulate the situation using one of these very, very unloving methods is another sin. Mm. So, so we're often committing four or five sins in a row in one little interaction. Does that make sense? And then add, like, well, me and Justin have been on and off for like five and a half years, I think, so that's yeah. all added up. That all adds up and nobody releases their emotion. Like, you know, we're not like the child. Remember the example I gave on the first day of the child falling over, having a cry, getting up and then walking. No, no we fall like over. Pretending to cry. <laughs> <laughs> we have a pretend, you know, like everybody. <laughs> to try should. and get my own way. You can get your own way. And, and then we go, I'm not doing that again. Like, this is how we are, you know, we, we, we store up the old emotion as well, which yep. then adds to our propensity to commit further sin. Yep. Yeah. So a very negative process that we engage. Can you see that? Yep. Thank yeah. Thank you. If we come across to Chris on this side and uh, Graham on this side. So. Um, I was going to ask you how, if... if if you were like in a situation with someone they're afraid, how do you actually love that person without, I guess, reassuring them? And yeah, you encourage that. them to feel their fear yeah. rather than reassuring them. Yeah. Most of us revert to reassurance. So we try to make their fear lessen by reassuring them. That's not the way. Yeah. The, the way is we want this fear that's in them that's now come to its head to be felt by them. If we really love them, we'll encourage them to feel the fear and to really feel it rather than be reassured. But most of us skip into meeting the addiction because the demand coming out of the person who's in fear generally is make my fear go away, make my fear go away. And we know that the reward we get from that is, oh, everyone thinks we're lovely if we make their fear go away. And so what do we do? We reassure them. Yeah. Right? This is why a lot of you don't like me. Because I don't reassure you when you're afraid, right? And that, and that then causes, well, well, he's not loving me anymore. I remember one lady, years ago it was now, in one, in one group, she told me that I was the most unloving person she's ever met. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yeah, there's a lady who desperately wants her yeah, fear. <laughs> so, so loving someone who's afraid, you're going it, to, it's kind of challenging in a, in a way, unless you've taken those steps to like build on it. Yeah, it, it means that, you see, if I'm on the receiving end of somebody else's fear, I have got to be firstly sensitive enough to see that it's their fear. Secondly, sensitive enough probably to know what the fear is about, to, if I'm going to help them. Thirdly, I need to not feed their addiction in order to feed my addiction. 
Do you understand what I mean by that? So if I f- most of us learn that if I feed a person's addiction who's afraid, they'll think I'm a nice person. Yeah, and that's, that's our addiction then. Yep, that's yeah. my addiction now, wanting, to feel, wanting them to feel that I'm a nice person. You follow me? Yeah. And so what I do is I feed the addiction. I, I you know, pander to it or, or I, you know, calm them down and say, it's all okay, going to be okay, it's all going to be okay, whatever, that they need to think I'm a good person. So that's telling me that my addiction to feel I'm a good person is worth sacrificing, I'm worth sinning, it's worth sinning for. So, so that's my problem. So we've got to realise what we're getting out of it. Correct. Yeah. Most interactions where there's demand satisfied you know, an addiction satisfied, there's always a codependency in it. We're getting something out of it as well as the other person. And that can pretty much set up a relationship, can't it? Sorry? Doing that can actually set you up in a relationship. Of course it can, yeah. yeah. Many times it does, in fact. I think it's love. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Like, for the average person, if you make... The reality is, and, and you can try this as an experiment if you want, but I don't know if I'd recommend the experiment, but but the reality is, if... You could get a woman tomorrow yeah. by just doing uh, three or four things. Make their fear get less, make their guilt get, guilt get less, make their shame get less and respond to their anger and do whatever their anger demands. And she'll love you for the rest of her life. The thing is, I sometimes do that, but then I'm like, I don't really want a relationship with this person. <laughs> exactly, because it, it's going to hurt. Yeah, It's going to yeah. hurt you. Yeah. Right. It's going to not be loving it's to yourself. It's not a long term. And it's not loving to them either. Thing, yeah. Right. But the reality is most relationships are based on those four things that I just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, it probably we need to add a fifth and that is sad. Sadness. If I pander to a person's sadness. If it, just those basic emotions, if I pander to them, if, I, if I'm an adept at pandering to any one of those emotions, I will end up sexually involved with the person. It's automatic. Automatic. Yeah. Yep. Interesting, huh? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. That's n- none of that's based on personality. None of that's based on their real self. None of that's based on who they really are. None of that's based on myself or who I really am. It would just get you further away from <coughs> yourself in the end. It does. Further away from your soul, mate. Is that exactly. And, and doing that, you'll get further away from God too because you, you just exactly. you're living a lie. And so in the end, we end up with bad relationship, uh, with a lot of pain. And then no, we, on, on then no we walk out of it going, why am I in so much pain? You know, oh, that bitch, <laughs> she did this and that to me. You know, when reality is I did a whole heap of things too. You see? Yeah, thanks. Yep. Um, who was next, Graham? Um, if you're an expert at suppressing your anger or any of those other ones, mm-hmm. such that you're, you're unaware that you've got it mm-hmm. uh, and you're in denial of it and all that sort of stuff, um, does the manipulation and the blackmail, that's still there even though it's not overt? Um, what, uh, let's make it more personal. What you do <laughs> is you use intellectual argumentation to cover over the anger that's driving the decisional questions. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So you come up with what you believe is a logical reason for, you know, f- for coming up with an argument that will help manipulate the other person, but it's actually driven by an angry feeling. So, so the key for, you, for yourself, Graham, is to, is to look at this desire to feel anger is not there. You don't want to, there's an emotion you don't want to feel. Does that make sense? At this stage, the desire to feel anger is not there. You have, so you have an emotion, anger, which you don't want to feel, which is not being humble to the emotion. So you know that's an issue. So the very first thing that needs to happen is develop an aspiration to actually feel all emotion. And in, in this case, feel anger. Now, the way you develop an aspiration to feel anger rather than sort of live in it or, or act up on it even without being aware is by actually doing the same thing as you would do to develop any other aspiration. And that is to work through the reasons, right? Feed yourself with positive, the positive thoughts and stuff that you need, but also work through the reasons why anger is a bad thing in your own definition. So this comes from, if you remember back to your childhood, you mentioned the other day your childhood, right? Back in your childhood, mum and dad, both very angry people, it was like powder keg waiting to explode, but nobody ever said anything. Nobody, it was like, it's like living in a, like a time bomb, 
tick, 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 every moment of the day without it ever exploding. Right? And that's a very confusing thing for a child. And it t teaches the child that anger is not allowed as an expression. You're not allowed to have it, even though it's there inside of everything. You feel it. It's not allowed to be expressed. So the key for you is to develop the aspiration to begin to express your anger. Now, you can do that without harming other people. You just develop the aspiration to express it, to connect with it, to feel what's there. So the first step to that would be just develop an aspiration to even be aware of it. Correct. And, and, be, and for you, remember I said that the, it, you use logical argumentation, or what you believe is logic, as a way of covering over the anger you feel. It's just occurred to me now that I use logical argumentation as a means of manipulation. Correct. Correct. Okay. That's all right. Yep. So I can see the end result. So there's got to be the, the anger in the middle. That's right. Yeah. So, so remember, whenever we're attempting to manipulate a situation, to, to bribe or blackmail or manipulate a situation to get what we want, there is obviously something driving us into that place. And, and this is where I see many of us engaging this process of manipulation, bribery, blackmail in, in all sorts of ways. Like many men use logical argumentation to do it because, th because they've learnt that they can sort of get around women that way. They don't have to connect to the woman emotionally to find out what she's feeling that way. They can manipulate her emotions to a degree. So many men have learnt that the way to, a, to work around a woman, to really confuse her, is to come out with a whole heap of logic that's got nothing to do with the man's emotion. Because the woman's just feeling the man's emotion and responding to that. But if the man comes up with all this other intellectual in argumentation, then, then he detunes her from his own emotion and then might even manipulate her into doing what he wants. Works really well with Jen. Yeah. Mo mo it works well with most women because most women don't have confidence with regard to their logical ability. So most women will respond to it. That's why men use it all the time. All right. So many of you women have been played by men that way, right? A bit of logical explanation here and there, and before you know it, you're in the sack with them even. And it's like, how did that happen? <laughs> you know, it's like, that's, that's how it happens. So we need to understand every time that we have a desire to manipulate the outcome of any interaction, we are, in fact, out of harmony with love. So my desire to present you with the truth is not a manipulation of the outcome. I, want, I just want to present the truth and what you do with it, completely up to you. I've never placed any pressures on you to do anything with it, with the one exception, and that is any time you've been unloving to me, I've prevented you from doing so. Does that make sense? So, so there's no manipulation there. Does that make sense? But, but for the majority of us, what, when, with our daily interactions, there is manipulation there and we need to see it. We need to see, okay, I want the person to see this particular thing because of something I want in return. What is it I want in return? So one thing I've learnt to do, uh, like uh, as Mary will bear witness to, is the fact that I, I do not ever manipulate Mary. Does that make sense? In any way. I just present her with the truth and leave her with a decision. Yeah, never for a specific outcome. So could it be... Like, I, I suspect it's probably easier for me to see my own manipulation of others than it is to see my own anger. Of course, because it's the manipulation that covers the anger. So I could, if, if, I, if that's easier to see, then I can use that as a tool to help me get in touch with my anger. Correct. Okay. And, and can you see, it's easier too for you to see this as unloving behaviour as well. So yes. therefore you have a, more of an awakening to that being unloving. Yep. than you do to the anger being present. Yep. So, so it, in some ways it's going to be a lot easier for you to access the reason why you do it if you allow yourself to see that you do it. Mm -hmm. And this is where it becomes, oh, I, wa I want to do that. The average person on the planet wants to do that. They want to manipulate external events and external people, family, friends, children, adult, uh, anybody around them to meet their demands. That, that's the whole point of life for most people, right? And what we've got to see is every time we do it is an act that's unloving. 
And once we get to see that, we start seeing how we're manipulating, uh, and manipulating events and people around us. And we're frequently doing that. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, I'll just time. Just let me check my time. I'm already five minutes over, actually. So, and there's important stuff I want to discuss with you still. So, so we need to have our 20-minute break. Sorry, guys. That's the end of our Q and A. So we'll have a 20-minute break. So that means if we can come back at uh, 25 to two. Is that right? 25 to 2? That'll be great. Thank you.